I am with Charlie Gasparino, everybody. Welcome to Walk-Ins. Welcome. So good to have you. Thank you for having me. I just want to know, I just want you to know that you had me at woman. <laughs> so I'm jogging one day. This is like a year ago, right? So I'm jogging. I listen to Rogan when I jog because it's, you know, you take about an hour and get through some of his podcasts. And he has this crazy woman on and this crazy woman keeps going, woman. <laughs> and I was like, who the hell is this? And then I said, wow. This chick is cool. I got to listen to her. So you're on my podcast. I just want you to know. Thank you. I, I, uh, yeah, I've, it's been a strange time in the world as you've documented yourself. You're, and you know, your social media feed is, a, I really respect it because you tweet <laughs> like me, but I have nothing to lose. <laughs> you have yeah. a job, sir. How do you get away with being such a pit bull online? Uh, you know, I drive my wife crazy, just so you know, she's always like, if you go back and put Twitter and Gasparino, you'll see me getting into epic Twitter fights with people. Um, I never start them, you know, I never throw the first punch. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, it's, I, I get like this, it's kind of interesting. So most people I think like me, I mean, I'm, by the way, I'm not taking a poll on this and it's, my margin <laughs> error might be off by a gazillion percent. But, you know, when I meet people on the street, most 99 percent of the time, they're cool. But on Twitter, for some reason, I like I, I get it. And I, and I get at people in the weirdest ways. I get at like Trumpers and I get at liberals like, you yeah. know, there was a, there was a stretch, uh, you know, about two months ago where Gavin Newsom attacked a column I wrote as racist because I I termed um, Kamala Harris a possibly a DEI candidate, and I laid out why. And you know, no offense, but Joe Biden essentially confirmed that. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, so he attacked me, and then like a week later, I was on Fox and I was debating a former Trump administration official about uh, how Trump spent a lot of money. He's not exactly a budget hawk. And then Trump <laughs> called me a never Trumper, Charlie Gasparino, never Trumper. And I was like, you oh, know what? I, I, I feel like a ping pong ball. I mean, uh, one side attacks me. But I think in some ways when that happens, when you do what I do, you, you're doing your job right. Um, one thing I will tell you as my job is that I try to be unscrupulously fair, you know, I, I scrupulously fair when I when I report about people, I give them chances to comment. This book, obviously, my book, Go Woke or Broke, it's about wokeism in the in the boardroom. It has an, you know, I'm not, I'm not pro woke, just so you know. <laughs> probably gets that. Um, but <laughs> that would be hilarious <laughs> if your book was about like why it's really decision. good for you to go woke and go <laughs> yes. broke. Yes, that would be perfect, right? You know, uh, but 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 that said, everybody gets a chance to comment, and mm -hmm. I was scrupulous about that, and I think that's key to journalism. I mean, I think you can have a POV. I think you just need. To be fair, and you know, I came up the traditional way uh, as a journalist. Um, you know, I write columns now, and I, you know, do books. But I was just a meathead reporter. I mm -hmm. broke a lot of news. I worked everywhere from something called the Community Current in Peekskill, New York, where I used to pick up the police blotter, believe it or not, uh, to the Wall Street Journal and Newsweek. When Newsweek was a real magazine, it's mm -hmm. much different now. When it was a real powerhouse magazine, and um, I came just as a simple country reporter, you know, looking to break news. So, and I think some of that is missing now with, with journalism. It's, you know, it's a lot of, a little too much activism, so to speak. Yeah. There, there's so many questions I have for you because you do strike me as someone who's an old school journalist. And my kind of first thing that I was wondering about is what is your process? You know, how do you go about your writing a book like this, but even, even just what's your process in general, even if you're writing it. I started as a columnist at Playboy yeah, no, I know. and, and I used to be like, I'm not a journalist. I'm just a columnist. And my brilliant editor, Joe Donatelli, who's now back in Ohio, he was like, all great columnists are journalists, Bridget. You He's don't right. get to be a lazy columnist. Right, you get sued for libel. <laughs> you still yeah. get sued for libel. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, listen, this is what I, I like. A lot of kids have worked for me, filtered through as my producer. And being a, my producer doesn't mean you just get me on TV. You got to write. 
you got to report. Um, I tell them that you got to learn how to walk before you run and before you box. You know, I used to box mm-hmm. when I was a kid. You know, before I got in the ring with really good people, I learned my craft. I had mm-hmm. a good teacher, a good, good coach. And I, it's kind of like that. And it's like, and then it becomes second nature. You know, my brother is a black belt in Taekwondo. He would tell you that, you know, you learn the easy stuff first. And then it becomes second nature as you move on. And so what I did was, I, again, I came up traditionally. I got the police blotter at, at the Peekskill Police Station, which you know anything about Peekskill, New York. It's kind of a roughest, rough town. I grew up right outside it. And, um, you know, just doing those basic things, writing a 27-word lead, covering the city council meeting, just doing basic reporting, getting stuff right. When you get wrong, you write your correction. I got a lot of my wrong stuff like where i meant x but i you know i quote i quoted this guy and it should have been that guy i mean kids make these mistakes i got it through my system you know early on you know where a place where you can make mistakes and i kind of went from training wheels to the bike to on and on and on and i think you know those sort of building blocks is what it's kind of missing today i mean you do get the impression that kids come out of journalism school and, you know, they either, you know, go right to the Washington Post or they start, you know, cover national news for a blog or something. And, you know, I I didn't do that. I, I kind of my, my career progressed, I think, the right way where I learned how to write. So I got to the Wall Street Journal in 95. I was a tabloid writer before that. I worked for New York Newsday. And, you know, people were like, oh, can he write a narrative? Can he write a front page story? And I couldn't, obviously. But I but I got my ass kicked 40,000 times. You know, I put myself in that vortex of getting beat up by people that knew how to do that Mm -hmm. to learn how to write the narrative. Then it became, can you write a book? And I'll never forget putting myself through that. And I've written six since. And I think that's the kind of progression you don't really get. And that doesn't mean I I don't make mistakes because I do. And I, you know, kind of stand up and say, I'm sorry. And, you know, write a correction every now and then. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think you got to kind of go through that. And I think, obviously, I think mistakes aren't so bad as long as you're fair. And if you notice some of the mistakes that are made on social, on, on, on you know, journalism today is because a lot of these reporters are not fair. No, you know, they're not fair to Donald Trump. You know, they're they're clearly not fair to him and they're not fair to I see it more on the Republican side than the Democratic side. They, it's like they're you know wickedly activist. You know, I grew up admiring Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, and I actually know Carl Bernstein pretty well. Um, they would go after anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, they they just didn't give a shit. You know, they wanted the story. And I, I think we're kind of missing that. And, you know, if you want to know one reason why journalism is failing is because we need reporters that don't give a shit. We need to go after everybody equally. We need them to be fair. Because the public is smelling that this thing ain't right, you know. That's what's it's interesting. I fe- I think that I've seen a lot of crossover in the role of journalists and the role of comedians, and that was yeah. something that was surprising. And this kind of ties into your book as well. I thought our loyalty was to jokes, and that everybody got made fun of, and then things started right. changing in 2014. You know, it started changing like 2013 around the Me Too time. Mm-hmm. And then 2014, 2015, it got real crazy. And 2016 and beyond, I think it's come back off the brink. A lot of people held the line and maintained some kind of just ability to poke fun at everything. But journalists too, that was my understanding was you are supposed to go. And I think local journalists still do do this very well. You are supposed to go after power powerful people speak actually speak truth to power actually try and hold people in power accountable and it didn't matter which side they were on and like you said your you your real loyalty is to the story and to the truth of whatever that story might be early in my playboy career i went in to cover i'll never forget it i went to cover a free the nipple rally thing <laughs> And I'm right I, there with you. I'm I right was, there with you. <laughs> I, most men are, sir. <laughs> and I, thought, I, mean, that. I, mean, it Jesus. <laughs> I thought that I would be very, and I was very in favor of this. I'm like, yeah, this is, this should be obvious. Like, it's not fair that women have. And then I went to the rally and the girl was like 18 who organized it. 
And it was all these young girls and there were all these lecherous dudes on the beach. And I was like, put your baby toots on. Of course. Like I left and I was saying to my editor, I'm like, I came away from that. And I talked to so many different people and I talked to the, it, it was just really interesting. And I'm like, I came away from that so completely with a different point of view and a different opinion than I had going into it. And he's like, Good. That means you're doing journalism. <laughs> that is it. I mean, listen, don't be, listen, I, I'll tell you what I did in this book. And not that they could talk me out of my general thesis that going woke is really bad for everybody. It's bad for comedy. It's bad for business. It's bad for journalism. It's bad for everything. You couldn't talk me out of it, but I gave them the opportunity to try. And, right. you know, I gave black, I called the Black Lives Matter. They did not return calls for comment, just so you know. Um, but I spoke with the Center for American Progress. I spoke with every bank CEO. I spent a lot of time with Larry Fink. I don't know if you know who that is. That's one of the most powerful men in the country. He runs BlackRock, mm -hmm. which is the biggest money management firm, the, the, the firm that pushed ESG. And I've known him for years. I've covered him forever. You know, before he became Mr. ESG, he was just a big time guy on Wall Street. Um, and I, 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 I basically said, explain your side of the story. I want them to see his side. And, you know, he turned me on certain things. He, you know, he turned me enough on certain things. that I got a great review in the Wall Street Journal. I don't know if you saw that. But I got this crappy review from another pu conservative publication, which I'm not going to name because I don't want anybody to see it, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> um, that, but he, the, the guy attacked me for, he says, going easy on, you know, people like Larry Fink, which I didn't. I did a journal. I, I performed journalism, which is give me your side of the story and let me be fair about it, even though I don't agree with it. But let me see if I can see the humanity in what you are doing, right? And and, and or, or at least the the sort of the business concept here, the the sort of uh, broader political concept, the, what you're trying to do with ESG. Some of it is based on you know he wants to do the right thing. I, I don't think it's the right thing, by the way. I, I, I say that in the book, but I, I gave him the chance to to talk me out of my thesis, and I and I think you know I try to teach the kids that work for me. Let them talk you out of it. And then let's you and I discuss and we'll figure out, you know, how to do this in a fair way. And I, I think there's not enough of that. You know, it's just it's just it's just so partisan right now. And mm. you see it on the news pages, you know, one thing on the editorial page, but on the news pages, really bad. I mean, I saw something in The Times the other day where it literally said in the first paragraph, well, you know, we shouldn't take Trump voters for granted. Even though we think Trump is this horrible, disgusting human being that, you know, is going to destroy the world. I mean, I, I, I was like, I'm reading this. It's like the first three paragraphs. Yeah. You know, you know don't you know, you're giving away the story. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's interesting, too, like the the. Yeah, there's so much there, because I think what happens is that you get accused of being nice to someone when you operate in good faith, like being too easy on someone when you're giving them a good faith. Absolutely. You're not approaching them as, oh, this is an evil person. Absolutely. And a caricature. You're saying, what is your actual, please explain your point of view. What yeah, is it, your, how did you come to these conclusions and decide that this was something that, is good. We've made fun of Larry, I think, on Dumpster Fire because I believe he was like, yeah. trying to back away from ESG. Oh, he is. Um, he, is. He, he told me why. He said he made a huge mistake going into the the S and the G. He should have stuck with the E. He told me. Right. Um, but you know, I give him credit for having the balls to come on and talk to me about it. I mean, yeah. so many others didn't. I mean, he explained himself. He's. I've known the guy for years. Trust me. You know what's fascinating about Larry Fink, and, I, and the book kind of talks about this. He was the least woke guy I know on Wall Street. I mean, he's a typical bond trader. Larry Fink created the mortgage backed security back in the eighties. The reason why you can you can buy a house with a thirty year mortgage, banks don't like making thirty year mortgages because they have interest rate risk that lasts thirty years. That's insane. Right. So what they do is they they give you the if if you have to be able to package all those mortgages into a bond and sell it to someone else so it's off their books. Right. Larry Fink created that mechanism. Mm -hmm. Now, some of that was bad because it led to the 2008 financial crisis. <laughs> yeah, it, right. I'm like, it, I feel like this caused some problems. <laughs> but it did, it did help a lot of people. <laughs> you know, I, I have a 30 year mortgage and that's probably one reason why I do. Yeah, that there that was another one of my questions was how do you have access to these guys and how did you get them to t talk? Like, why? Why do they tell you anything? <laughs> Is it because you're fair? Some of that. Here's something else. 
I, I think, you know, I'm going to say this tongue in cheek. And it was, um, the, it was Robert Novak who mentioned this back in the day. Uh, you remember Bob Novak was a longtime Washington columnist. He was Evans and Novak's probably before you, it was before you were born. So you wouldn't know. Um, but it was, he would say, I have sources and I have targets. Now there is a theory that if you talk to me, you know, at least you get your side of the story and he's not out for you. Mm. Now, just so you know, that is not my modus operandi, but I think that's in the back of some people's minds, to be honest with you. You, know, you have to talk. To, and by the way, that's why a lot of people talk to Bob Woodward. Right. Why not just help? You know, he's going to he's going to write it anyway. Why don't I just shape it? And I think that's why important people do that. And I do have a platform. I have a platform you know, book. I have my columns. I write book reviews for The Wall Street Journal. I'm on TV. So and when you have that sort of platform, you know, you do have access. Now, the question is, how do you use that access? Do you use it? Are you an asshole? You know, one thing I was proud of this book. Um, is that I wasn't an asshole. And, you know, my my wife actually read initial copy and she says, you know, you're not using Dylan Mulvaney's preferred pronoun. Now, this annoyed a lot of people in the conservative movement that I use preferred pronouns in this book, even though it's an anti-woke book. Dylan Mulvaney, as you know, was the, the trans influencer that caused the huge ruckus being in a bubble bath half naked, you know, sipping a Bud Light, trying to sell the beer. I mean, yeah. it's obviously one of the most woke, the dumbest woke things in the world. That's one thing about this book is a lot of dumb woke stuff in it. It'll make it's, and it's not, it, this is not a textbook. It's a narrative. It makes you laugh. I got into a lot of Dylan Mulvaney, but what my wife said is like, you know, you're not an asshole. You yeah. treat people with respect. You know, I know trans people, um, I have friends of mine who uh, live with trans people. Um, it, and you're not like, you don't hate them. You, you're friends with them. You know, yeah. why, not why well, refer to Dylan Mulvaney as a he when you know that's her preferred pronoun is she, and I said you know you're right, and I did, and it pissed off some people in the conservative movement. Oh, you know you're mixing genders. Only two. Listen, I believe there's only two genders. Trust me. Right. But I believe as adults, you know, you should be able to um, be what you want to be. Um, I am, you know, but where I draw the line obviously is with kids, and I mean, right, and one right. of the problems with Target, and it's another big example, is that they were proselytizing kids into right these lifestyles that they're, they're not, they're too young. I mean, when I was a kid before I was 15, all I cared about was baseball and, right. you know, boxing and sports. I don't think, I think we inundate kids with sex way too much. It's like, you know, what are we doing? You know, we're yeah. robbing them of their childhood, you know? And, yeah. and I think these corporations engaging in that with the progressive left is a huge, huge problem. And you obviously have a backlash against that among parents and, uh, and rightfully so. And the book gets into a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Have these companies recovered? Like, has Bud Light recovered? No. You know and what's interesting? Has Disney Target? Has, listen, they've all backed off, obviously. You know what's funny about Budweiser? Budweiser is no longer owned by Anheuser-Busch. If you know anything about Anheuser-Busch, all-American company. I went to the University of Missouri, right? So it's in Columbia, Missouri, in the middle of the state. I was a New Yorker. I talk about, like, me sticking out like a sore thumb. Yeah, <laughs> culture like, shock. The, the accent, the whole thing. And back <laughs> then I had a mustache and went like this. I had hair that went like that. So, um, you know, uh, they've never seen Italian people before. Right? Yeah. But it is a big journalism school, which is multicultural, just so you know, all over the place. They have people from all over China. We used to have a huge China contingent. Uh, so it's international. But, you know, it was just interesting being in, in that school and I remember in order to get like a little city life, we used to go to, to St. Louis and there's an Italian neighborhood in St. Louis called the Hill. I used to love it there. I used to hang all the time. And then we used to go to the Anheuser-Busch plant, which is mm -hmm. South St. Louis, which is this all American. I mean, you know, you go there, you know, you see the Clydesdales. It's like a throwback to history. And it's just an amazing American company. The, the Cardinals Stadium, I think was named, renamed Bush Stadium get to drink some free beer, go on a tour. It's really Americana. So this company then sells to a big company called AB InBev, which is a very Davos, Davos, you know, centric company, an international company. Yeah, are and they then, German? Where are they? They're Brazilian and some Belgian. They're a bunch okay. of hedge fund guys. You can read about uh, them. Okay, okay. A bunch of, bunch yep. of bean counter and, you know, you know, 
knuckleheads. I call yeah. them nuts, whatever. But anyway, they're allegedly smart. They like hanging out in Davos and thinking big thoughts. They turned the company that was once a you know all American Spuds McKenzie hanging out with hot chicks in the bar, which was one of the funniest, best commercials I remember as a kid. It's why I yeah. drink Bud. Um, to that, to this giggling trend, you know, tr- you know, trans woman in a bubble bath. And so you got to ask yourself, how does that happen? You know, the book explains it. Then it, then it, then the social media backlash occurs. Budweiser has now gone from number one beer, Bud Light, I should say, to number three, and it's not recovered. Mm-hmm. Disney stock, which Disney has done some of the same stuff. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, one thing I found interesting about Disney, when I started engaging with them about all their woke stuff, particularly the sort of um, just like sort of gratuitous insertions of same sex kissing scenes in children's cartoons. So I, you know, I asked, you know, I have a friend of mine who's the PR longtime PR guy there. And I said, um, and it was a difficult conversation I had with him because he's a nice guy. I've known him for years. And, you know, he knows that I'm not writing a positive story. So I say to him, I said, you know, what made you guys do this? I mean, you know, these are cartoons. I mean, and, and by the way, in the if you look at it, in the Bud Light year was the big famous example. You know, it wasn't really part of the narrative that there were two, I guess, lesbian characters in this. It just kind of came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was like, well, if you blinked, you uh, you would miss it. I said, but most people didn't blink. They saw it. They're with their kids. They have to explain it to their kids. You know, how do you rationalize that? And he really couldn't. But then the backlash happened. Do you know that Disney stock has not moved since 2014? Wow. I mean, that's, that's amazing. So the, the, so if I put up, if I look down a chart right now, the S&P 500, right? Mm-hmm. Look at what the chart, you know, the S&P 500 is up a gazillion percent since 2014. Disney is flat in the water. Wow. This is like one of the greatest companies around, run by who was then considered one of the greatest CEOs, a guy named Bob Iger. Yeah. Handed it off to this guy, Bob Chapek who then kind of doubled down on wokeness because he felt like he had to. And then it went back to Bob Iger and he still can't write this shit. Yeah. That's wokeness. Larry Fink lost a trillion dollars of assets after the backlash occurred at BlackRock over How, years. Are you dealing with an HMO like I am? If you want any testing done, you have to go make an appointment. And then if you need a specialist, you've got to go to a specialist and it's a whole rigmarole. Not anymore, folks. Quest simplifies this process. I can purchase my own lab tests online and test for a multitude of health issues I might be concerned about and then take those results to my doctor better armed with the information I need. Not just a doctor, by the way. Like, I'm going to take mine to my acupuncturist. At questhealth.com, you can get hundreds of tests across several different categories. You can do a full blood work panel. There's male panels, female panels. There's perimenopause panels. There's panels, STD screenings, allergies, heart health, hormones, sexual health, etc. as I was mentioning. These are lab quality tests. They're the same ones you'd be given at your doctor's office. Use the affiliate link below for a 25% discount and order your test and then visit a nearby Quest Diagnostics location for sample collection. Again, use the affiliate link below for a 25% discount and prioritize your health today with lab work on your terms. Getting in shape can be hard. Everybody knows this. It requires hard work, discipline, and in my instance, someone to be accountable to. And that's why I'm excited to partner with Caliber. It has been truly life-changing for me. Caliber is a strength training and nutrition coaching program that's completely personalized to you. Through their app, you get paired with a personal trainer, an actual person, not AI, and they put you on a fitness program and also help out with your nutrition. In my instance, she looked at me and was like, you need double the protein you're getting, and we're going to start with weights two to three times a week. And she tailored that to my needs, what my time is, like where I'm at. It's freaking amazing. It actually has been life-changing for me. I see my body composition changing. I also feel different. And I also, my brain feels so much better just even eating more protein. Like that alone has been a godsend. We've arranged a special deal for our walk-ins welcome listeners and viewers. If you go to caliberstrong.com slash walk-ins, go to that link, you get $100 off your first three months. And you get a 30-day money-back guarantee. So click the link below to get signed up, caliberstrong.com slash walk-ins. 
I'm getting so strong. I am getting strong. How do you define woke? You know, I have a um, definition in the <laughs> in the book. You know, it's it's a mindset that I think is it, it, it's 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 rigid. It's um, it shows no um, there, there's no room for error, and it's it follows a bunch of progressive sort of stereotypes of how one should act, and if you deviate from that. You're you're branded a um, a heretic, mm-hmm. and I and I think you know what I what I respect about you when I started like listening to you after I listened to Rogan. What I like like about him, what I like about Chappelle, and you know you you comedians that said fuck you, we're not going there. Yeah, you know, we're not going to take this shit anymore. You know, c- comedy is supposed to be about a f- you know within limits, right? I mean, we're not talking about offending people. And, you know, Don Rickles used to make fun of everybody. But you should, even if you I, do I, offend people, agree, like, oh, oh, well, fucking man up. I'm sorry. Yeah, man up. I mean, what's the worst thing that, I mean, what's so bad about people making fun of it, every, anybody? You know what I'm it's, saying? I mean, yeah, I think it, it, we, even if you end up using comedy as a disguise for being cruel, Ultimately, in the long run, that it's not sustainable. People won't like you. Like the, you, the I trust the kind of markets to correct that. You know, right now, you look at what's happened in comedy, and guys right. like Kill Tony is huge. It is oh, a, love- it yeah. is massive, and it's one of the biggest shows on earth right now for comedy. Probably the biggest comedy podcast, and it is truly a reaction to what you've seen in the culture of all of this kind of nanny state tone policing. You know, I think, I think that Wilford Riley, I love his definition of, um, woke, which I should try and just always have on hand because I think it's very, yeah. Um, because people get mad and they're like, Oh, you wrote this book or you use this term and you don't even know how to define it, but it's because it's so insidious. The problem with wokeism, whatever you want, however you want to define it, which I would say is um, everything is viewed through the lens of power. There are oppressed and not oppressed. And there right. this this and the privilege and the non-privilege. And there's and a, a and kind of a hierarchy. Rigid, and a rigid ideology. And an there's ideology no redemption in it. No redemption. Yeah. It doesn't bend. It's clearly progressive and it doesn't bend. And if you it, it, the scary part about this and as, how it seeped into corporate America government is, you know, particularly corporate America where, you know, people are worried about their jobs, right? This is not like, you know, people have to pay the mortgages. If you rebel against that mindset, you're fired. Right. You, or you could be fired. And it's and it's sick and it's insidious. And I, I you know, I think it needs to be exposed by people like me and you and in different ways. But I think that we're kind of foot soldiers in a movement. Right. And, exactly. Uh, and uh, average people, by the way, here's what's scary about it all. Like you and I have outlets to expose this. Yeah. The average person doesn't. They got to keep their fucking mouth shut or else they're going to lose their job. And yep. they're told that almost. Um, I, I think, you know, that's what, you know, that's why it's sort of incumbent upon people like you and I to kind of step up, you know, um, I mean, Jordan Peterson does it all the time, right? Yeah. I mean, he's been canceled, but they're trying to take a, his, his uh, shrink Passport license away or whatever. Him, right? Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I'm going to take his Canadian guy. passport away. I, you know, I don't know <laughs> the guy, but if he didn't have to go back to Canada, would that be so bad? I mean, Canada. Yeah, but still, it's like it, Canada's well, lost is anyways. Fan. Canada's <laughs> completely. So yeah, Wilfred Riley, that's what I was looking for. His definition is um, means you think the system is structurally oppressive today. Performance gaps prove this and the solution is equity. And yep. I feel like that's a very simple way because it is something. And people don't know how to point to this stuff because not everybody has the time and effort like you and I do to and to go read James Lindsay's book about you know, all the stuff that's come out of academia in terms of all of this, all of the lingo and the 
institutional racism and um, equity versus equality. I mean, I've literally got gotten a college education in this in the past five years. And for somebody like my dad, for instance, or someone who's just kind of been floating through the culture and is like, what's going, you know, is a good, I would say very good, like old school liberal and is like, what's going on with this? Like the trans, you know, like, what are these pronouns? They, there's, there's no easy that it's easy to just say, oh, that's woke. Like, I don't have. I don't know how to define it to to people who are well, you know, no offense, but you know, what was the guy? I, I might I might be mis, misquoting someone, but Potter Stewart was a Supreme Court justice. So one of the Supreme Court justices said, um, uh, you know, pornography, what is it? I know it when I see it. I mean, you kind of right. know it when you see it here. I mean, it's like a rigidity, it's progressivism, it's it's not even liberalism. Listen, I grew up with liberals as teachers. Right. You know, I was a kid that neither my parents went to went to college. They didn't barely. Went. My father went to trade school. My mother dropped out at sixteen, and I grew up very working class. Um, you know, we had a UPS plant behind my house in Yorktown Heights where they wanted me to be to be a teamster back then. You know, unloading trucks. You know, because it's steady pay. You know, but I went to school and I went to schools that I can get into before I got into Missouri. And I had liberal teachers who taught me about Dostoevsky, about Tolstoy, about, you know, how to think out of the box. They weren't big Reagan guys. I went during the 80s. But they taught me to be a free thinker, to to challenge them. That's what liberalism was, the real liberals. Totally. Oh, Charlie, you're kind of conservative, but, you know, ha, ha, ha. And, you know, let's talk about this and go back and forth and fight it out. And well, those were the liberals that I grew up with. This is something different. This is Stalinism. This is like you're off to the the proverbial you know re-education camp or mm-hmm. worse if you don't agree with us. At least that's what they want to do. Uh, that's what these sort of progressives that have sort of infiltrated these sort of it, it's and it's not like they're just in the university classroom. They're all over them. They're all in corporate America. They're in academia. They're in our cultural institutions. And you know they're there now. There is a backlash, and the consumer backlash is significant, which I talk mm-hmm. about which is why this stuff is starting to fade. Thank God. That's um, this. And lawsuits are happening too with like the, you know, the kids and the gender transitioning yeah. and stuff like that, which is, I think very I, good. I, I can't get my hands around that. I, you know what, you know, I'm going to tell you something. I had prostate cancer um, and I've been good for two years. Congratulations. Um, thank you. It's, you know, it's nice, but I'm, I'm always worried. I'm always, mm-hmm. That's why I work out so much. I'm just like a freak about this stuff. Um, I just read that alcohol consumption increases your can- chances of cancer. I'm not stopping vodka, just so you know that. But <laughs> I've, I've almost got 11 years, which I'm is not, nuts. I don't do anything else. I like a couple of vodkas at the end of the day. So in any event, <laughs> um, I, uh, I went to, they, they invited me because I wrote about it and wrote about my experience, you know, at NYU Lingo, which was very good about, um, uh, about prostate. And, you know, part of the, the sort of urology department involves gender you know transitioning for people and you know they, they they do gender reassignment surgeries on kids and i was like i didn't say anything you know it was just i was in the audience and you know treated me nice and everything but i was thinking to myself what doctor would do this thing yeah not the and good ones usually I just, unfortunately it's just and so it's funny so i had this debate on twitter as you know i'm always fighting on twitter one of my <laughs> friends is a this is actually a friend of mine who's a longtime journalist um and she's an award-winning journalist worked for the times for years and uh she was like you know i just want you to know charlie i know you you know you but you're being so mean to these kids some of these kids really need help and you know blah blah and i said to her i said diana what is worse for a child, for, for like a 12-year-old, puberty blockers or smoking cigarettes? What would you advocate first? Would you advocate? I, I would advocate smoking cigarettes. I would too. Because you can quit. You'd be fine in a few years. You do puberty blockers. You're fine. Irreversible. Yep. It's irreversible. It's, it's, it gets in your endocrine. I'm not a doctor. My brother is. My brother's the chairman of medicine at Brooklyn Hospital. It just messes with your organs in ways that are irreversible. And, you know, you're playing with fire here. I I told her. Yeah. I mean, listen, kids need therapy, not castration. 
You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I think this is a pretty normie position. Again, I, I feel like I got caught in the crossfire of the culture wars for saying pretty normal things. Like, I, I don't feel like, like woman, a very, very... Yeah. Did you like, get attacked for that, actually, for the woman thing? I mean, I get attacked for everything. I, <laughs> but but I'm like you. I am I don't care. I'm free. I am free. I don't care. I've been called... Just yesterday, I was on Normal World, and one of the comments was... Did Bridget get rid of her TDS that she got two years ago? I'm like, if you look at my comments from two weeks ago, dumpster fire, everybody's calling me a MAGA Karen. Like, it, I am I that too. Schrodinger's By the you way, know, why voter. Can't, why can't you <laughs> fuck with Donald Trump? Who the fuck is he? I mean, because I like, listen, I've known Donald forever. Just trust me. I could give you Donald Trump stories. I like, I like the guy personally. I covered him when I was at the Wall Street Journal. and. You know, the guy is hysterical, first off. He but, is. Like, I literally was just retweeting a video of him going, talking at a rally about, I still can't stop laughing about it, where he's like, you fat asses need to get off the couch and I go vote. That. And he's Joe, like, Harry. Joe, get Harry. your fat ass and vote. Or Gary. What do you have Harry. to do for the guy? Harry. Harry. <laughs> So Harry, I know get Donald your fat Trump. ass out of the couch and go vote. Come that, on here. That, I was like, I'm voting for him. That is totally him. That is, and I, the, the, the jokes this guy used to tell me when I call this. So one day I call him and, um, he, no, he calls, well, I call him or he called me. He goes, you know, Charlie, Charlie, this, this asshole that is the New York attorney general is attacking my great university, Trump university. Oh God. So, You're like, so I'm said, not dying on this hill, Don. <laughs> yeah, so I said, okay, well, tell me about it. So he says, you know, it's horrible. You know, he's attacked. He said, if I did this, this, and this, and this, and I hired this one guy, it would go away or something like that. Oh, boy. Like, I was like, all right. I go, who's the guy? He tells me the guy's name. He said, I remember that guy. That guy used to, um, that guy used to work for Elliot Spitzer when he was no. the attorney general. And, and he went after Dick Grasso. Remember the New York Stock Exchange? Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, yeah, that guy's a jerk. I mean, he tried to say Dick Grasso was sleeping with his secretary or something like that. They, they, were, they were implying that in their depositions. And <laughs> Trump chimes in immediately. goes, Charlie, let me stop you there. No secretary is fucking Dick Grasso. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, what do I say? <laughs> and, but then again, I'm going to tell you, he could be so, so nice. One day I did a story. I was at Newsweek, so 2005. And I did a story about I was going to do a story about his, his Trump line of clothing. Like he had this clothing, like suits with little cheese on them and shit, and, you know, jackets. Fucking and guy. It. It's fucking great, right? So I call him up. I called up his longtime assistant, Norma Federer, I think her name was. She's a sweetheart. So she goes, Hey, Charlie, is this Donald always asks when you call, is this a bad story? I said, uh, No, it's not. It's not a bad story. <laughs> so, he, so he calls me back and goes, Charlie, you know, you could be a pain in the ass. Is this a bad story? And I said, Donald, it's not, it's, uh, by the way, he wanted everybody to call him Donald. And I said, no, it's about your clothing line. And he goes, oh, and he starts talking forever about this fucking clothing line. We do this, this sort of package. It was really nice. It was funny. We talked about his hair. This is when The Apprentice was big. He calls me back the next day, goes, Charlie, that was amazing. Thank you for being a man of your word. What do you, if you need anything? I said, yes, I'd like one thing. He goes, what's that? I said, my wife is a huge Apprentice fan. I'd just like to take her up there and see the studio. The apprentice studio. He goes, my pleasure. I'll give you a tour. And he gave us a tour. Wow. And he was such a mensch. He was yeah. such a guy. He's a decent guy. With that, the crazy shit is not really him. He, you know, he's got a bad temper. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, yeah, I, it's funny. You can't like to go back to why can't you go after him? I do think the other side of Trump derangement syndrome, which should be a phenomenon that is studied is Trump devotion <laughs> syndrome. So oh, they yes. are like two sides got, of the I same. They're my family. <laughs> yeah. See, my two sides of the same the coin, though. Like there, there are people who this the, the, the people who have the derangement and the people who just are so devoted to him, they can't. They see him as their guy. They can't hear a single bad thing about him. They kind of worship at the altar. And I'm not, I'm just not that kind of person. Like he, um, I, I am an equal too. opportunity. I'm sorry. Like the guy says crazy, insane stuff long before I ever 
even knew about like if you grew up on the east coast and had friends in new york and you were working class you heard all about how he like shafted people out of paying for stuff and like <laughs> you know back in the 80s when he was building stuff it's just it, it's like i don't know he had just been around for so long that i think i had had a like mixed bag of feelings about him but watching people i mean truly really smart people just the absolute hatred that they have for this man it's, and it's i have abortion but i've been at dinners where they will openly say things like well i can't admit it online but you know i texted my friend like too bad they met i'm like you're saying this at a dinner party and you think you're the good guy i know it's ridiculous you know he, he, First off, let's go through his policies. If you just take the policies, the traditional Republican policy. These are not like, you know, far right wing, you know, lunatic. I mean, he kept us out of wars, cut taxes. He didn't really cut the budget deficit. That's where he called. That's where he got pissed off at me because I got him jammed him on not cutting the budget deficit, which added to inflation eventually. So he did play a role in the, in the inflationary spiral. Yeah, he didn't like the fact that I said that. Trust me, and, it's um, true though. It's true, and you know what am I going to do? And you know he came up to me once. This was like when he was running the first time. Um, I was in the spin room. We were doing the Republican debates at Fox Business, and um, Neil Cavuto was moderating the spin room, which was hysterical because, um, you know, you, you get to say hello. You know, I was going to go on with Neil, but before I went on, there was the candidates went on. So I met Carly Fiorina, I met Ben Cars, you know, nice people. It was funny. Jeb Bush, remember Jeb? And he he was like beating the shit out of Jeb Bush. Poor he Jeb. Looked, he, he looked in the spin room. I'll never forget this. Because I, I caught him looking in, and I'm sitting here. Neil is talking to Trump over here, and he looks and he goes, "Fuck that!" He kept walking, so he left the spin room, and he went to like a seat, like like in another room where he he gave his spin room talk. Um, and then um, and then Donald, when he left, he was walking through, and he comes up to me. He goes, and he's I'll never forget. He was with Melania, and uh, he goes, "Charlie, oh, he's writing all this shit about me. Like, you know, aren't we friends? We've known each other for years." I said, Donald, you might be the fucking president of the United States. Grow up. He goes, you know, you're yeah. right. Let's take a picture. And then he, <laughs> well, he goes, I want you to meet my, my wife, Melania. <laughs> and I, I just slipped that in my mouth. I said, Mrs. Trump, when he becomes president, you're going to be the hottest first lady ever. I, I, I just, it just came out of my mouth. And then he looked at me, he goes, and who's going to give a fuck about me? All right, let's take the picture. So we all stood there, we took the picture and, um, I took it with a Republican donor, a guy named John Tatum, who's actually from Dallas, uh, of all places, because you just mentioned Dallas. Um, and uh, But that's Donald Trump. He's kind of like an a regular guy. He is. Uh, and the other politicians aren't. I'll never forget. So like, so he he approaches me. He used to go, go like, so I used to write things, because I used to be critical of his trade policy. That's where I really didn't agree with him on, you know, tariffs and all that stuff. Because it is like, a t I'm not a brilliant person, but isn't it like a tax on us anyways? Listen, I mean, it doesn't... Is. It is. It always comes back to bite you. But, you know, listen, if you do it strategically, listen, I, there's no way that China should get away with murder against us in, in trade. And you got to give him credit for bringing that up at first. Mm -hmm. We're going to level the playing field with China. I think this sort of across the board thing. And, you know, it's kind of crazy. But anyway, back in 2016, I was writing a lot about that. So I get a call from a friend of mine. And this, is just, this is typical Donald. He's an Italian-American and he's in the campaign. The guy goes, hey, listen, I just got off the phone with Trump. I said, yeah, he goes, you know, he keeps saying like, what the fuck is wrong with Charlie? The Italians love me. Why does he keep writing this? <laughs> and I'm like, I go, can you tell him not? You know, like my grand, my aunt says, I'm 100% Italian. And, you know, I'm American. I was born here, you know, <laughs> I was born in the Bronx, of all places. Yeah. And, you know, he, uh, but that's the way he is. He, he's got these sort of mannerisms. Listen, I, I was watching that debate, right? I, I was sitting there. I had a you know, I'm having a great dinner. We we had a little debate party. All of a sudden, I hear him go, "They're eating the dog. They're eating the bats. They're eating the." Bats. You're like, oh the no, people, the people that live there. Oh I was, no, I just we. I was like, I just can't believe I heard him. <laughs> we live in clown world. How are you supposed to? I mean, this was my last dumpster fire. I'm like, how am I supposed to take anything seriously? <laughs> you expect me? But you know what's great about him? He's not telling you to take him seriously. He is, he tore this sort of scab off this, 
this this wound, which was take all these politicians seriously who've never done anything in their lives but be politicians. Yeah, I mean, Barack Obama I, I, he is a smart guy, but what did he really do before? You know, community organizer. You know, <laughs> I, I, Kamala Harris. What did she do? I mean, we we can go there if you want to talk about Willie Brown. I'll talk about Willie Brown. But I mean, it's and it was more than that. But it was you know, does she really have this stellar record that she's going to be leader of the free world? Now, Donald Trump had some shitty business deals. He had some good business deals. He does have money. He did make some money. I know that for a fact because I know the people. He, he was a big client of Bear Stearns, and I, I know exactly, you know, he, he did okay. And he built stuff. There's no doubt about that. He did build things. And, you know, when you look at him net net, this is why if he ever comes up to me and says, you're never Trump, I'm going to say, no, I'm like, I'll give you 70%, you know. Yeah. I'll give you 70 Are you tired of wading through media misinformation, trying to figure out a news outlet spin or bias on any given story? If you're like me, you know that everyone has a slant, but Ground News is the solution. Ground News is the most complete news comparison app. It lets you make sense of the news on your own terms by letting you easily compare how a story is covered by different sources across the political spectrum and around the world. I know sometimes in America, we forget the other world exists. This is the other world. (laughs) The rest of the world exists. That's how American-centric I am. My father, I signed him up for it. He loves it because he's generally in his own media bubble and has now been using this to kind of sift through. There's a great feature, Blind Spot, that shows you, like, if you lean more left, here are the stories you probably missed in your silo. If you lean more right, here are the stories you missed from the left wing. Use our affiliate link and get 15% off. That's Ground News. Use the link below to get 15% off. I use it every day. I love it. If you love Watkins Welcome, please consider becoming a subscriber to Phetasy.com to show your support. Phetasy relies on its supporters to continue creating the content you love. So if you can, please support us. It truly keeps the lights on and the content churning. Churning? And it keeps me going. (laughs) You also get a multitude of exclusive subscriber content. So come join us. Go check it out. Phetasy.com, P-H-E-T-A-S-Y dot com. So wait, he tweeted that you were a never Trumper? It, well, whatever, the truth shit. Or that, truth social or whatever <laughs> the F that is. And I so swear I'm, to I'm God, gym, Charlie. I'm, hit, I, I'm hitting the heavy bag, and then all of a sudden I get, like, calls. Like, my fucking Oh, soul. no. Up, so finally, it's my producer. I pick it up. I go, what? Did you get in trouble, or did I get in trouble? He goes, Trump, she just truth socialed about you. I'm like, what? Why? He goes, he called you a never Trumper. So she sends me the thing. And then I noticed my Facebook feed with all these MAGA people. Oh, fuck you. Fuck it. <laughs> <I'm like, laughs> Everyone has lost their freaking mind, I swear to God. I was thinking about, you know, Joan Didion is just brilliant. And I was, I've been reading her a lot lately. And one of the intros to her, actually, it's right here. Uh, she says it, it's, uh, slouching towards Bethlehem in the intro. I love it. It's such a line that I think of all the time, but my conversation with you is making me think of this. (laughs) She says, my only advantage as a reporter is that I'm so physically small, so temperamentally unobtrusive and so neurotically inarticulate that people tend to forget that my presence runs counter to their best interests. And it always does. That is one last thing to remember. Wait, hold on. It gets better. That is one last thing to remember. Writers are always selling somebody out. (laughs) I'm like, it's so true. So I used to have a hat that said, trust me, I'm a reporter. (laughs) I mean, at some some point, you know, we are what we are, scorpions in a way. Yeah. But I think if you're honest about it, and Joan Didion was among the most honest, right? And, you know, she, and by the way, being demure, sitting in the background, not being the story. Right. Try not to be the story. It's Mm -hmm. it's almost the opposite of what people think now. Listen, I do TV because I have to pay the bills, just so you know. If I had Mm -hmm. my brothers, I'd be sitting at my desk all day writing and Mm -hmm. writing stuff, breaking Mm -hmm. news. And I break news that moves stocks. You know, I just do regular news like Citigroup today is, you know, thinking about bidding for the Apple credit card. You might Mm -hmm. not care, but that's a big story. That is a big story. I do stuff like that. And, um, you know, that moves stocks. And so some of this is 
I, if I had my druthers, I, that's all I'd be doing. It's, it's harder to make a living now. We have to do what we're doing now because the medium has changed. Even TV has changed, right? People are cutting the cord. So you got to pay the bills. And that's why I do TV. But really, the best journalists are those that are kind of like, they're like snipers a little bit, right? They're in the background. They're in the weeds. They're kind of like a <laughs> Right, they're just white waiting, or the Navy SEALs, or yeah, you know, Marine Recon. You know, they're looking. And they're looking Do they exist them. anymore? Who? Those kinds of journalists. Well, I'm trying still. Yeah, yeah. You're trying in your way. No, nah, I mean, yeah, I I feel like um, it's funny. I I don't. I still have a hard time considering myself a journalist because I still feel like I know very little about you know, I've learned everything just by doing it. But well, that's I, what you're supposed to be. We're supposed to be generalists in many ways. I got into, te- just so you know, I got into business reporting because my old man, first of all, my father hated journalists, just fucking despised them. He was a Nixon, he was a construct iron worker and a bartender. Tough guy, grew up in the Bronx, grew up with all sorts of wise guys. His union was mobbed up. It was the Wirelanthers union. If you know anything about that, they were controlled by the Westies. And I, I knew all these. I knew the Cahills and the Leahy's and, you know, Ryan's. So since I was a kid, I used to call my call my old man up to do stuff for him, to you know, do this, do that. Um, and he hated journalists because they destroyed Richard Nixon, right? It's funny. <laughs> I was one of the guys that destroyed him. But uh, um, eventually, so um, so when I went into, started going into journalism, thinking about it, he was like, and by the way, he got sick very young. My father died at 53. My mom died at 53. In the eighties, mm, so I'm he, sorry. yeah, it was it was rough. And but you know, he said, "Listen, try to get try to learn about business, so you know you can write press releases for IBM." Which right. is, it was an IBM plant at, in Yorktown Heights at the time. Right. And so I took all these. So when I went to Missouri, which is a, like a top notch journalism school, I still took all these econ courses. I got a minor in econ, so just in case I could get that job in journals, I could be a business report, reporter. Um, and that's how I got into business reporting. It, it was interesting, you, but, 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 but my bigger point is, you know, we're supposed to be generalists and not know everything. We're supposed to be in a way trying to know a little, to be a little knowledgeable to be dangerous, but to then be open-minded to, to being talked out of stuff and to learn stuff. And I think that's where people like you come in. If, when you sort of, you know, you're open-minded about the topics. You're you're looking to explore the topics. That that is journalism in a, in a different setting. In in in, in and I, I think as long as you're fair, that's called journalism. You know, and I think that's what the you know Rogan is, is in a sense a journalist. I mean, I know he keeps saying. I, I mean, I don't know the guy. Just so you know, you know him. I don't know, but I I feel like it's weird when you listen to someone all day long, so many times. Like I have, you feel like you know, but he says he's like a dumbass, and he's. I heard him say that about himself and I heard him say that he doesn't know anything, but that's not true. First of all, he's not a dumbass and he does know stuff, but he, he keeps he's an open curious. mind and yeah. he's curious. And I think that is kind of what is missing here. Yeah. Because, well, so much comes up when you say that one, one question that really jumps out at me is do you, what do you make of you? I'm sure since you're on Twitter, you've seen the meme, however much you hate journalists, you don't hate them enough. You know, what do you make of this kind of, very strong anti-journalist sentiment that is pervasive, particularly on the right. But, and I think rightfully there's a lot of mistrust and distrust and, and resentment and anger at journalists. I call them journalists because they're, they're activists masquerading as journalists, which has destroyed a lot of credibility for the entire profession. But there, I really try to resist that because I know that the, I think the truly good journalists are, it's like a calling. It's like comedy or one of these things where it's very thankless and you're toiling away and you just have that dogged sense of like, I have a question and I can't rest until I get some answers. And they're usually working at, you know, local newspapers and these are getting shut down. And what, what do you, what are your feelings about this? Cause you're in, you're in the trenches. Well, I got lucky that, you know, I'm older. I, you know, I had, I was doggedly ambitious to the point I almost broke up my marriage 4,000 times from working late and, you know, doing what I had to do. Um, 
so I kind of made my bones <laughs> to use a bad word for an Italian American to use early on. So I'm established. I, I do worry about the kids. Now, here's where I do worry about that sort of mindset of being a journalist that, you know, fear no neither fear nor favor, right? Is that the journalism departments, the the schools that produce journalists, you know, the sort of elite schools, you know, are inculcating the, the kids into sort of wokeism. Right. And, you know, I don't know if you can be the journalist that I'm talking about. I mean, listen, you could be a liberal and be a journal, the journalist I'm talking about. You can be a conservative and be the journalist I'm talking about. You can't be an ideologue on either side. You can't be woke and I, you can't be like some maggot supporter or else you're not mm-hmm. going to be a journalist. You're, mm-hmm. you're just something else. I mean, columnist, I don't know, but whatever. You're not a journalist. And I think this, the, 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 the sort of elite institutions aren't turning out MAGA people, but they are turning out sort of woke. And and I think when you say you, know, you resist the, the 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 sort of urge to attack journalists, which I think is a <laughs> trust me, I appreciate that. <laughs> but uh, but you know the, the people that attack us, particularly on you know sort of middle America that is not totally MAGA or just you know people that are just may vote for, are, will vote for Trump but are not ideologues. They have a point. I mean, there's a reason why I wrote this book. Nobody else did it. The, if you right. look at a journalistic account of corporate wokeness, that doesn't exist. There's there's polemics. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy wrote a polemic on it, right? right? I think it was called Woke Inc. There's a few other stuff that people have written polemics about ESG. Nobody has called up people and say, what do you think? Why'd you do this? And, you know, trying to develop anecdotes showing. I mean, my opening scene in this book is literally at Goldman Sachs where a bunch of kids are argue with each other because somebody says we should eat Chick Fil A for on Deal Night. These are the the, 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 the junior bankers that have to plow, you know, work hundred hours a night, a, day, a week. They have to and they eat at work. And yeah. you know, what do you order? Well, somebody says let's order Chick Fil A, and then uh, like a little little food fight broke out because someone says, well, the guy that ran Chick Fil A is a racist Southerner, hates, and, and I go through the whole thing. Um, you know, I did that story. No one, you know, it was actually, it was broken by my old producer who reported with me, Lydia Moynihan. You know, we, we did it for Fox Business. We did it, it ran in the New York Post, but it didn't go anywhere else. And, wow. and that is such a telling story about what's going on inside a major company that that would happen. Right. And so the the critique of journalism being, you know, tilting the scales to the left is absolutely right. And no, it is. I'm not saying it isn't, there. but it's like, you know, journalism, it, I believe, plays a pretty important role. And well, I, let me ask you I fear that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, that's true. I mean, but, you know, sometimes you have to knock it down to build it up. You know, listen, one of the biggest one of the biggest journalism, I think, scandals of the last at least 10 years had nothing to do with Russiagate, you know, Trump, you know, and whether he had sex with Stormy Daniels or not. Uh, you know, I kind of tend to think he did, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, you know, but Or anything, you know, all this crazy stuff about Trump and neo-Nazis and things like that. You know what it was? Why did the Washington press corps miss Joe Biden's mental implosion yeah now think about this now i'm going to tell you something last year i was year, talking about this last night okay, so so right in your wheelhouse last year 20 june 2023 as you know i cover wall street a lot uh, there was a spate or not, not a spate but a, a rash a raft you know a lot you know a bunch of wall street research reports gaming out the, the probability that joe biden can't make it this is last this is 2023 yeah this is on wall street they were saying this. So I wrote a column in the New York Post that talked about this. Wall Street doesn't believe Joe Biden's going to make it. Here's why. Here's what they're saying. And here are here's the scenarios if he doesn't drop out by the end of the year. And it's and they're all pretty bad. Like one the one major scenario is like you can replace him at the convention, but there won't be any time to vote for whoever it is, and it's likely to be Kamala Harris since she's the vice president. And that's it. it so Wall Street was actually smelling this last year i mean we, we can smell it way before i mean and so, like normies yeah. were talking about this in 2020 right. when he was running in 2020 right. but just think 2023 june people are saying yeah. this, this this can't go on and by the way that would have been the time to drop out and yeah. do a real primary and everything right and where were the where was the washington press corps 
probably I mean, was just drinking margaritas and shit. I don't know. Do these kids even drink? I, you know, I wonder if they, you know, the old time journals I used to go out with used to drink three martinis and then write. I mean, I, I remember that. And they did a great job. But I'm just saying that like, I'm, not, I'm not advocating that. I don't touch anything before 630. Okay. That's my rule of thumb. But, you know, and I have to work out before it every time. But, you know, here's the thing. You know, where were these Washington reporters? And, you know, and then all of a sudden he has a this this sort of meltdown in front of I, I mean, I was watching it with other with, with um, Democrats and they were like, I can't believe this. I'm like, well, you can't believe this. This guy is like half in the bag all the time. And then, I mean, so, you know, where was the Washington press corps? That's a scandal. Yeah. And nobody's covering it. Well, people have talked about it. I mean, even we, even during, we talk about it. Even during the debate, it's like the the thing that was frustrating to me is is that there was such a missed opportunity because the greatest scandal of perhaps the past decade is that Kamala aided in this cover up of That's a it. president who clearly can't function and is currently our president, which we all just forget about, and <laughs> and was literally out there telling people that he was, you know, doing backflips in the White House, despite what all of us were seeing. And no, no accountability. And and when the press was like, I can't tell you, Charlie, how obsessed after that first debate, the Biden only Trump Biden debate. I, I was watching CNN and then I, I was, and I was watching this in real time. And then I stayed for the panel and I was like riveted by their meltdown because I was oh, like, was great. I, and I said, I'm like, he's fucked. He's fucked. They got the call. They, somebody said, oh no, we can't hide this anymore. So, and they went into like complete meltdown mode. Van Jones is crying. I'm like, you guys, <laughs> how well, you are either liars or you're horrible at your job. I'm a nor normies can see that this guy is not okay. And it you're like, supposed to be journalist. I mean, Charlie, it makes me, it makes me uh, crazy. It was funny because, um, so I'm at this table at a very nice restaurant in Manhattan that I, 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 my friend owns the restaurant and he gave us the table so we can watch the TV. Um, place is called Caravaggio. If you ever go to in Manhattan, go to Caravaggio. It's like one of the best restaurants you ever. Charlie, got to. I am. A, I don't know what kind of money you think I have, but I'm a very poor person. <laughs> Next time you come to New York, I'll take you. All right. Okay. Like, okay. Um, That's a deal. You know, I got some book money coming to me. So <laughs> okay. But, 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 but anyway, um, so we're there. I'm with a senior producer at CNBC, where I used to work. Um, a top New York State Democrat. Uh, a top uh, real estate person, both are women, Demo a Democrat, who gives them all sorts of money to Democrats, me and him and my producer and somebody else randomly. And we're all sitting there and, you know, mm -hmm. and the Democrat, the, you know, my, my two friends and they're, they're like friends of mine. And I, you know, they, they call me a right winger and shit. And, you know, it's funny. You know, we laugh about it, but like I, normal I, Americans. Yeah, so I, so I look at them, <laughs> I said, so they're like, I, Ah, he can't answer. His his mouth is moving, but nothing. And I, and I said to them, I said, dude, I said, Bess, what the fuck did you think? Yeah, he's toast. This yeah. guy is brain dead. Yeah, this is weekend at Bernie's, dude. Yeah, I mean, what the fuck? Mm. And she's like, oh, I didn't know it was this. I said, come on. I mean, everybody's it's all. And so it's but by some of this, she might not have known it because you know what? The receptacles of information that she indulges in which is probably MSNBC and, you know, Rachel Maddow and, you know, occasionally CN CNN, although CNN is trying to ch get fairer. I mean, I could tell you, I know a lot about CNN. There's I should be on CNN. Here. You should go on CNN. You'd like it. Um, I know I should, because I can be just the normie suburban mom voice. Talk to David. <laughs> you know, he's a nice guy. The guy that runs Warner Brothers Discovery is such a nice guy. I don't know. His name is David people. Zaslov. He's such a great guy. I've been covering him for years. He used to work at NBC. Um, what's great about my job is that I know the guy for a long time and, you know, I'm, a, I'm into food porn. I mean, not the sexual food porn, but I, I like, no, I know. <laughs> I was like, whoa, <laughs> the interview <laughs> just went off the rails. Well, but, no, I like beating Bobby Flay and, you know, Ina Garden. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. into all this shit. My wife and I are totally obsessed with I'm it. I'm so but, obsessed with it. I watch, yeah, um, I like to cook, you know? Yeah, me too. 
What's the chef's table? I'm obsessed love with that. chef's table. Love it, love it, love it. So I call him all the time. I said, what the fuck? Don't you get another guy's ranch? He only reruns. And he goes, all right, calm down. I'll put a call in. So that's what's that's a good part about my job. I could actually call. But, you know, CNN is trying to make um, a, a move to the center of, uh, based on what I know. Um, but, you know, the people I talked to that I was at the dinner with were all like, they just watch MSNBC and just, right. You know, uh, left wing blogs. And, and so it was like, and they read the New York Times, which wasn't, where was the New York Times on this? <laughs> By the way, yeah. I comedy was the same. I was at a, I was at a show and this comedian got up and she said something that I, I, I wrote it down because it was such a, I was like, oh, this is why people were genuinely surprised. She said, <laughs> she said, I was going to vote for Biden anyway. So I never watched him on TV so I could vote for him in good confidence. And I was like, that is actually the truest thing I've heard in a while. And it explains to me why so many people were surprised because I think they just looked away so that Listen, they could vote for him. Like they knew, but they were like, ah, I'm just not going to look directly at the sun. Although a lot of the mainstream comedians did not go there. Now, here's what's interesting. I mean, in the old days, you know, my com my comedy heroes was you know Richard Pryor, and you know, I, I love Don Rickles. I actually got to know Don Rickles a little bit towards the end of his life. Wow, um, it's just an amazing guy. Um, Richard Pryor, and you know, Lenny Bruce. Obviously, I watched, and you know, these were, and George Carlin. You know, these were I guess you could say they were liberals. I don't know about Don Rickles, but. But, you know, I actually love Jackie Mason. I got to know him a little bit over the years. But they were they, they spoke truth to power a lot. And it was a lot of social commentary. They would never have let sleepy Joe Biden go by without with no jokes. And the, the mean, mainstream oh, Johnny Carson would have made fun of him. Jay Leno I, would have made I fun I would of hope him. so. I don't know, though. But think about it. Except for you and Rogan and, you know, and a few others. You know, nobody was was like basically laughing at how absurd Joe Biden was when he was talking. And this guy's the president. And, you know, co comedy, you know, the late night shows, certainly. I mean, Jimmy no, Kimmel, none of the late night shows. They didn't do anything. But Greg this... Gunfeld did. But, you know, again, he's a little bit niche, right? Well, here's Although my he question. He's not the biggest audience now. Here's my question to you, though. Is that because of, you know, we were talking about this on Normal World. Well, I guess it'll probably air tonight. Like, that. remember Saturday Night Live, Kate McKinnon singing Hallelujah? Oh, yeah. We were yeah. like, this was like the moment no, that Saturday I knew. Lives. But is this because these corporations have been taken over? Are they are they yeah. getting some kind of marching orders? Like, here's here's the line we're going to tow. And you can't make fun of Joe Biden because how NBC? does this... Run by Comcast, big woke company, of course. I mean, you know. So it just, is like they're afraid of losing their jobs if they go against the yeah. grain. Yeah. And by the way. They because they're employees the too, grain. even though they're famous, they're still just employees like all these other people you're talking about at corporations who are afraid to say something remotely Republican at their job or remotely center or not insane. <laughs> Listen, I mean, you know, I have to admit, I laughed when Alec Baldwin did Trump, and that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, he was so, really good at it, but what a missed it, opportunity. Yeah, but, you know, and I, but I remember Phil Hartman doing Clinton's impersonations where he was jogging and looking at yeah. the girls and then pulling French fries off people's plate. I mean, that, that was like really good stuff. And, yeah. You know, they, they even went after Chelsea, which I'm a little against that with kids. But I remember like uh, Victoria Jackson doing a Chelsea imitation, which wasn't too cool in my view. But they they went out there. You know, comedy right now is so woke. I, I talk about it in the book. And why? Because it's corporatized. You know, you're not corporate comedy is woke. Oh, it's horrible. And it's horrible. It's just But no boring. one's watching that. Well, that's the whole thing. That's why I mean, Tim this. Dillon launched his new pre premiere for his like new show that he has coming out on Netflix. And it's him basically bringing back the Jerry Springsteen for J the Jerry Springer format. And it's like it's what an amazingly perfect venue for Tim. And it's just it looks hilarious. But I think guy like Andrew Schultz, Shane Gillis has a show. These guys all survived this and they're not only thriving, they're very, very wealthy now. Well, I mean, there's a reason why it's called Go Broke, the second part, because the corporatization of wokeness is is a loser. And I, by the way, I have an argument in the book with Mark Cuban on this. You know, Mark Cuban, the Dallas Mavericks. Of course. Football. I think he's, he's lost people. his mind. He's lost his mind, but he's a, he's a nice guy. He but, seems know, like I a argue. very nice guy. 
he'll you can you will argue with him. Like you should probably have him on the thing just to I would love to just to argue with him for two hours because he's out of his mind. But you know, Mark, you know, was like, oh, the big all these big companies, um, you know, are uh, are woke, and you know, they're all tech companies, and look at this, and look how they look how they're making so much money being woke. And I said, okay, Apple gives me this. Okay, this is what I told him. I said, um, does that mean I'm virtue signaling when I go up this and I listen to Bridget Fetessy and Jason Whitlock and all these all these heterodox non wokesters and Rogan and Chappelle? Does that make me woke? And he couldn't answer that. And I think you're getting to the point that you know media is changing. And this is mm-hmm. where I, you know, I, I, you know, Hillsdale College, you know, interviewed me for my book, and you know, that's a conservative college. It's very, get, it's very hard to get in. People are sending their kids there because they're teaching kids the basics, you know. Like yeah, exactly. Like math, critical science, thinking, economic, critical thinking, yeah. questionative literature, and you know, the guy goes, "What do you have to say to kids that want to go into this business? You know, you can you can you give them some great advice? Pep, give them a pep talk?" I said, "No. <laughs> this, <I> said, <laughs> the problem with the business is that it's like." It's changing, and I, I can't tell you where you know what the business model is. It's it's yeah. all over the place. It could be what you're doing. It could be what I'm doing. It could be. I think it's going to be a combination of everything. Yeah, but it's definitely not going to be woke. It's definitely not going to be her- It's going to be heterodox. And, it, and and by the way, you're going to have to learn basics. You're going to have to learn how to write something, to think critically, to be fair. And to present both sides of the story before you come to your conclusion, you're going to need to do that. And I don't mean in the mamsy pamsy way, like, oh, this is your side. This is your side. Let the viewer describe. I mean, you do. There has to be critical thinking involved in here. Yeah. And um, and 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 how this business model shakes out is beyond me. But it's definitely not this because it's all failing. I mean, when was the last time you watched Colbert? But yeah, exactly. Other than clips to make fun of him. Um, but what, what I, what I was wondering too, you know, Hollywood seems completely dead to me. And I was like, always convinced that the, they cared about making money. And now I'm actually not sure over the past five to eight years, I've become convinced that it is all just propaganda and a vanity project or whatnot to get a message across because they seem to not care about the fact that nothing is making money or is that changing no i don't think it's not yet um i i think you know hollywood is going to be the last place it changes um because they're also afraid they're also woke and they're all i I know people that are in that business it's very hard to break in and be heterodox i mean think about it could tropic thunder be made no god no i watched that the other day my favorite movie yeah, my sixth sense of humor. I said it. I watched this seven times. My wife goes, "Can you just not watch this now?" I oh, watched I it. Love it. It was so good. Just every scene that Lincoln, it's whatever brilliant. his name was, it was just the, the last scene where he's playing the. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna get myself in trouble without recounting the scenes. But um, you know, they couldn't do that today, and that movie sold. Um, yeah, could they do Patton today? I've seen Patton a hundred times. Yeah, a war movie. Could they do a, a like a pro American war movie today? Hard. Oh, that's interesting. You know, when when uh, Clint Eastwood. I don't know. They they love Dick Cheney now, so maybe they can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that just shows you what a weird world we live in. Darth Vader. You know, I like Liz Cheney. I, I know I haven't seen her in years. She used to be at Fox. She's not anymore. I I want to you know check myself. I don't want to piss on him, but you know, if this tells you one thing, just how fucked up. The Democratic Party is. They've embraced the guy that got us into the worst. I'm, war we've it's ever crazy. Been. I have a tweet in my drafts right now that I wrote the other night and I just didn't tweet it yet. And everyone keeps telling me that I need to tweet it. And I was like, um, it says I'm sticking to my progressive principles and not voting for the side that has Dick Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, how's that motherfucker still alive? I hate to say it like that, but I mean, that guy survived. Did he survive like a lot of shit? He did. I mean, didn't he get shot? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he shot somebody else. No, he shot. Oh, somebody. you're right. Right. He shot somebody. That's right. <laughs> Bird shot. Yeah. Yeah. That guy is got that guy. Maybe, you know, I bet you if you like shave back hair, you see six, six, six. Nah, I'm, I only, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. 
as we wrap up a little bit, what do you, what, you know, you kind of end on the note that things are changing. Do you think, why should the average American care about that? How's the book doing, by the way? Is it good? It's selling well. Good. Okay? Did not make a bestseller list. Uh, I think it's got a long tail, but it's- I think know, I it does too. So. It's got a, good, it got a good review in the journal and, you know, listen, um, uh, I'm very happy. They're happy with it. So that's- Good. Know, Got an email from my uh, from my publisher the other day. So here's what I would say: um, wokeness does affect the average person, and it affects. And it's horrible because it affects them at work. It affects what you see on TV. It affects you know you know the image making of America. Um, it, it affects how companies behave culturally because standards are imposed on the companies to be woke. Now, I did a column today, which took off on a piece I wrote, a section of the book about Jamie Dimon and J.P. Morgan Chase. Jamie Dimon is America's banker. J.P. Morgan Chase is the biggest bank. Jamie Dimon and J.P. Morgan Chase support the human rights campaign. They and they 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 they, they, they apparently give them money. At least that's what the, that's what they told me. That's what someone at the bank told me. They will not deny it. They're a platinum corporate partner of the human rights campaign. Go back and look at what the human rights campaign is all about. It's a far left organization, mm. anti-Israel, pro Kamala Harris. Why is the world's biggest bank, the nation's biggest bank, and the big and the maybe the best banking CEO of my generation? I've known Jamie forever, supporting this left wing activist group. I'm not saying you should you you uh, you shouldn't be supporting anybody. I mean, just just be a banker. So why are you going there? And that's changing the culture and that's changing the po politics and that's tipping the scales in our society. And that's why you should be worried about this. And average people tell me all the time, you know, there's a scene in the book where these five people got, they worked at a, a consulting firm. They got called in a room and they said, okay, by, by HR, we got a real problem here. Um, there's been a microaggression. <laughs> And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, but microaggression after we have a real problem will never not be hilarious. <laughs> okay. So they were like, what? They go, well, you know, someone in this department. We have a real problem. Oh, what is it? It's so some, a micro this, problem. <laughs> this is this what it is. I mean, we, you know, it was more than five. It was like a bunch of people. So one of the first people that got called in, somebody called, told this black woman that he liked their hair. Said, oh, I like the way your hair looks. And the black woman took offense to that because she straightened her hair out. And um, she thought what he was saying was, I like your hair because it's white looking. Mm. And they all looked at each other and they said, why are we ever going to be, like, why, why are we going to talk to anybody at work again? Right. I mean, that is what's kind of going on. Sensitivity training sessions. Where, oh, yeah. Where like this, this guy teaches CRT, critical race theory at American Express. Yeah, right? where you know doctors have to take you know diversity DEI pledges. I mean, it 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 it, it permeates everything. Now there is a revolt against that. Part of this is illegal. You should know after the Supreme Court ruled. Oh, definitely against affirmative action in college admissions. It was based on Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Title VII involves employment, and they're written almost the same way. Um. So stuff is starting to change and people are just sick and fucking tired of it. And it cuts across racial lines, by the way. Oh, definitely. This is not. This is not. And, 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 then, and then it becomes the sexualization of everything. And I think that is sort of a tipping point, particularly when it gets into kids. Yeah. Again, you know, when you start proselytizing kids in a major way, like Target did. And, you know, I, I don't have kids. All right. You know, um, so when I see LBGTQ plus things, it just kind of goes over my head. Fuck, you know, and just walk right by it. But if I'm, but I, I've been told by moms that have two kids, and by the way, they don't have daycare, so they take care of the kids. They take, they're strolling their kids through Walmart or, or Target, and they see a tuck friendly bathing suit on a mannequin for a man not fully transitioned next to a rainbow colored onesie, and this like endless aisles of pride stuff. They're like, you know, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, I, I, it's just, it's jarring. And it's, you know, then you have to tell the kid, talk to him and like, okay, this is what this means. It's like, you really want to, like, when I was five years old, six years old, seven, eight, nine, I was like, ask my dad about the Yankees. I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, listen, I'm not saying that all kids were like me, you know, 
sexually curious when they're young. But, you know, those are conversations that are not supposed to be prompted by corporate America. Is my Yeah, opinion. or teachers. Or teachers, right. And that's the other like thing. Like all these <laughs> rubber room teachers. Well, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> we are looking for a Montessori for our toddler. Or uh, not even a Montessori. Just We're just looking at schools. And we've been okay. emailing people and just getting, you know, information. And we got something back from one Montessori. And it was like... Thank you for your interest, blah, 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 blah. Rachel, she, her. And we're like, no. Nope. <laughs> it's like, why does this need to be in a Montessori? You are teaching toddlers. Like, why? Well, it need to be anywhere. I almost put I in agree. my Twitter profile it. Now, I didn't do it because I was like, they're going to fire me if I do that. <laughs> and look, I don't care. It, again, you're an adult, yeah. whatever. It yeah, just, I agree. It, it's become a way to signal like what team you're on. But when it's like, I'm, I'm trying to find a place that's going to teach my kids. Like, she, you know, I want her, I want her to learn the alphabet, maybe some songs and play some instruments and like have some friends. But when I see that, I'm like, okay, so what other weird shit are you guys going to be teaching her? By the way, what, who would sign up for that? I mean, you know, lots I, of people. You got to be nuts. I mean, lots of people that 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 to me is cringy. Like I'm going to teach your toddler about sex. I mean, I mean, and and I'm I'm not I'm not implying that this person would. But in in the pronoun signal that you believe in gender ideology, that's what that means. Now, people can argue this all that they want, but that is what you are saying, whether you're just caving to the mob because you're afraid or because you actually believe this stuff that men and women can swap genders like Mr. Potato Head. And you, either way, I don't want to send my kid to a school where they're going to get the gender bred person. And now they're learning before they're two that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. And like, I don't even want to have to worry about that. I don't. You said before, why should the average guy care about the the message of the book? And you just explained why. Well, you're an average person, a mom, and then you're you're dealing with. Oh, I care. I mean, I have to care now. But the the fact that you brought that up, but this is is instructive in my view, is that this affects everybody. You're an average mom looking for a school. I mean, by the way, that person, you know, went to college, you know, is part of the, the DEI department probably of the school. Who knows? I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's, this is corporatized and right. systematized. Wokeness is sort of embedded in a systematic way. It's not going to, it's not going to, you know, we're not going to be able to dislodge this immediately. I mean, some of it is like identifying the problem, having people like you, having people like me write about it, and people like you make fun of it <laughs> so we can laugh at this fucking stuff because some of it is fucking insane. It's insane. And, and having the and having the American people just putting it in their lap and let them do what they want with it. And I think what they'll do is say enough. I'm grateful that you wrote this though, because so years ago on Twitter, I asked people how they were self-censoring because I had, this was when I was really getting caught in the crossfire of the culture wars and I was gonna write a piece about it. So I was like, email me if you've been self-censoring. I got I mean, thousands of emails from people all in this. It was all from people in corporate America and hospitals, nurses, engineers. And I was like, this shit is terrifying. And I was reading these. My cousin and co-producer Maggie, she had to like pull me out of. I was like, this is like communist. I'm like, I don't know what this is, but this is terrifying. And I was sharing it with James Lindsay. I'm like, look at these emails. People are sending me slides. They were sending me all this stuff. And he's like, oh yeah, this is, this is coming. You know, this is definitely not. And they were telling me about all these things that they had to go to. And the, the big kind of, you know, journalists online attacked me. They were like, oh, here's little miss like MAGA right wing grifter who's going to s- tell all these stories of how these right wing people are being censored. I'm like, these are liberals writing me. These are left. These are left wing or just normie libs who are writing right. me terrified to say this anywhere else and just happy they have an outlet to even express it. I never ended up even 
writing the piece because I got into such a dark place reading all the emails. And it's like you it's like you did this <laughs> journalism. Sounds, sounds like a book. To, well, here's the thing. Um, I think it was Hayek, Fred Hayek, Hayek, who said the road to serfdom starts with great intention. I'm bastardizing, but that's what he said. Road to serfdom is paved with good intentions. Um, you know, the Me Too movement, good intentions, right? But it became a cult and it became, you know, infused with wokeism. I know a lot of people that got caught up in that thing that were not, you know, we're not guilty. They were. I just, mean, believe all women was ridiculous. Like, I remember being. I was who in said a, it? Look who said it. And like a, a guy that I like. I like Andrew Cuomo. Right? Yeah. I really like him. I've known him for years. I know his brother. I uh, don't agree with him on politics. I, I think he'd be a good mayor of New York City, actually, because he's learned his, he learned about how bad the, Demo the left wing of the party is. when they So is Chris. I'm like, there's Chris no nice better thing. inoculation yeah. to wokeism than being canceled by your own party. And I think it's You're the right. only thing that wakes people on the left now, up. Now, Andrew said, believe all women at the or something like that. He parroted that until they came after him <laughs> and trumped up this ridiculous. By the way, the person that brought the charges against Letitia James wanted his job. It was so ridiculous. These, these, these things were like insane. Like he would say hello to somebody and look at her and she thought she looked at her chest. I mean, it was just like so nuts. Right. And obviously the, the, nothing was actionable. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. But they blew the guy out of office. Um, so, um, no pun everything. intended. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> By the way, no one—he didn't have sex. No one ever claimed I know. sex. That was the I, know. I told him once. I said, you know, for a guy that didn't get laid on this stuff, you know, you Ew. definitely, definitely, like, sucks you know, that you lost your whole <laughs> job and didn't even get laid. I mean, it's just the whole thing, and um, you know, and it was—it was so over the top and so absurd, and um, and the same thing with. ESG, when I talk to Larry Fink, I mean, this starts with good intentions and then it becomes regimented and woke. Then if you don't check these boxes, we're going to divest from you. If you're an oil company, you don't stop drilling for oil and looking at um, windmills, we're going to pull our investments from you. And we're going to do it at a time when there's rising inflation and there's a war in the Ukraine and oil supplies are constrained and it's going to be higher gas. Price. That's what wokeism does. It takes there is a degree, and communism was built on good intentions, right? I mean, they make but everybody this share is, everything. This is but then like it becomes mob terror. This is like yes. mob tactics. It's crazy. It is. it is because it's all about destroying the individual. And I think, mm. you know, the reason why, I don't know, I wrestle whether I'm a conservative or not. I, I don't know. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. But I, what I am. I feel you. Yeah, I, I, there are I a bunch of weirdos that. too. <laughs> Trust me. But there are, there is something to the, the conservative movement. I used to say I was libertarian, but then they got kind of weird. They're weirdos. <laughs> but then, you know, there's something about being, you know, devolving power to to people. The Constitution tries to do this that I love and I appreciate. And wokeness doesn't do that. Wokeness calls me a an oppressive white male, even though I came from working class background, parents don't didn't graduate from college, didn't barely graduate from, from regular high school, immigrants who came and lived in shacks and, and, and I grew up in a thousand foot house. Yet somehow, you know, General Pinochet's son from, from South America gets extra points at his SAT over me, you know, I mean, right. that's what wokeness says and it's absurd and infuriating and, it's got to die a thousand deaths in my view. Well, my friend, this has been rowdy and I love you. Um, I feel like we're just kindred spirits out there. Yeah, we're on the same plane. Next time you're in New York, look me up. I might be there soon, actually. Uh, there's potential, potential in uh, October, last weekend in October. Okay, there's I'm around. A potential. I I, I'm going to try and book speeches in Florida in the middle of the month, but other than that. Okay. All right. And if you're in Austin, you let me know. I used to go all the time and I don't do it anymore. I used to, I used to teach, a, you know, every now and then lecture class at UT. Um, and then maybe I you can go, teach at the University of Austin. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a conservative thing. That, isn't it? No, that's the like classically liberal thing. Oh, well, that's almost conservative, classically liberal. I mean, now it is. Now it's yeah. right coded or whatever they I, say. You know, I become a right winger when I was like some lunatic that people were like, mm, what the hell is he? You know, I, this is like, it's strange. Elon's a right winger now. Elon Musk. Who oh, yeah, I know. Really I'm aware. 
Uh, I mean, all the tech guys, even like Naval, the like hedge fund guys, if you watch their pivot to oh, yeah. Trumpers, it's hilarious. Bill Ackman, a uh, guy I know very well. Bill Ackman, Naval, even Naval, who like just famously never talks politics at all, is like had to get dragged into this. These guys aren't idiots, though. They aren't. They made a lot of money. Although, you know, I told I, I didn't tell I mean, Bill and they're correctly. kind of also idiots. Well, let me. This is the point I made to Bill's people for. So when we wrap up, and I made this to Mark Rowan, the guy that took out the people, the uh, chancellor and the president of um, uh, what was it? it was one of those Ivy League schools, uh, UPenn. Harvard. Oh, UPenn. UPenn. And you know, Bill was on the Harvard side, and I made this to their reps, both of them. I said, you know, Bill and Mark gave millions upon millions of dollars to these schools for years while they were inculcating kids with left wing dogma. You didn't think it was going to have any. I mean, this is the end result. When you when you bring leftism, we're not talking about classical liberalism. We're not talking about like you know Bill Clinton liberalism. We're not talking about Barack Obama liberal. We're talking about far left liberalism. Both. I mean, maybe Obama leftism. He was kind of a Saul Alinsky guy, wasn't he? He was initially. He's by the way, he's making so much money. He's not Solinsky anymore. No, he's he's voting for Trump. <laughs> he's, he's not going to tell you, but he's voting for that Trump tax cut. That's you know, amazing. Cut. It's so funny yeah, to me to think know, that like you know Obama that like, speaking at the DNC and probably voting for Trump. You know that him and his wife are looking at their taxes. Okay, well, if she gets elected. And the Trump tax cuts that don't get extended. We owe this. I, clearly, there's a you know they saw that freaking debris on Nantucket from the windmill, and they were like, "Oh, yeah. maybe we should shut this shit down." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are these migrants doing in my backyard? You know? They got rid of. They. We were talking about this on Normal World. They had 23 migrants on Martha's Vineyard. And they were gone in like 30 seconds. They know, couldn't like, even handle 23 people. By the way, I just walked through 23. 300 migrants on my way to work today. So, wow. I mean, you know, but you know, my, my bigger point is, is that I think, um, God, what was my bigger point? <laughs> Bill Ackman, Bill Ackman, oh, Bill Ackman. I told both him and Mark Rowan, I, I said, and they're people, they're people actually, I didn't tell them directly. I said, they, in, they, they, they financed the propaganda that has led to Jew hating on. Yeah. Canada. And yep. it, there's no way you can address it. And they were like, well, uh, but they did. Yeah, they did. They 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 didn't do it on purpose. They didn't do it directly, but they should have. But people like there there have been people like Thomas Sowell, you know, you know, Alan Bloom for years talking about Bill Buckley, talking about the closing. Of Bill Buckley got a man at Yale, which was in the fifties, but Alan Bloom in the eighties, the closing American mind. Thomas Sowell has been talking about this for years. Yeah, when Lowry about how these colleges have gone so far left in their core curriculum that you're literally indoctrinating kids into leftism your end result is now everybody hates american america and by extension america's proxy which is israel according to the leftists yeah and here you get and then you get you hatred i mean it's yeah. just it's inevitable yeah and so that's you know so when i when i hear bill and all these guys becoming born again right wingers i said guys you gotta fess up a little bit here you're like chickens coming home to roost all right what's your biggest defect of character oh what would your wife say? Temper. Yeah, I can see that. You're it you're Italian. I'm bad with guys. I'm a quarter Italian and it came out last night at a dinner. I was so mean to a friend. Like that fire it was just like I, I it has I've had to work on it my whole life, but man, it it's like I, it's like a small door opens in my heart and then there's just a little mafia that's like, you're dead to me now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, you know, here's where it comes out with me. And my wife did, will admit this. I'm good with women. And that's it's good. Only, it's because I got brought up by my mother who beat the fuck out of me and my brother. And mm. um, and we had to take it, you know, air pulling night, you know, uh, spoons and slippers and, you know, you name it. So, um. You know, so I'm I'm good with women, but if you're a guy and you kind of touch a few buttons, you know, I gotta stop. I'm almost ready to go, and I'm old now, so it's you know. What's your biggest asset? Empathy. Hmm. I, I try like to be empathetic, and I like being empathetic. I also like animals. I like dogs and cats. This is why this whole Springfield thing is freaking me out. <laughs> why aren't so, there reporters on the ground covering this? 
They, they, I saw something on Twitter. Has where anyone city, gone? City manager. Oh yeah, yeah. There's some. They they saw them cooking up some cats somewhere. Um, but the, you know they <laughs> in Dayton. I think it was. But, you know, listen. You know what was funny? I saw John Legend talking about this, and he goes, "I came from Springfield. The Haitian community is great." Blah blah blah. They then he goes, but they do bring different cultural um, characteristics. They eat different types of food. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. I, like, I don't think you really should have gone there. <laughs> the, this is the new cycle that they all make fun of, though. They're like, we're, we've are we gone from they're not eat, We'll go from like, it's like where they're like, you are here, where it's like, you you know, they're not eating the pets. They're eating the pets and you're racist. Like it's it goes from like they're eating the pets and it's cultural. Like you're racist if you point out that they're eating the pets. You know, there's like the the site the news cycle. But what do you think they? You know, my friend, my my brother dated a Vietnamese girl. I'm not gonna, you know, I, I'm nothing against Vietnamese people. I think they're wonderful. But she told me they used to get dog in L.A. Yeah, they eat dogs. I mean, they do. I mean, I mean, they, they, we country, we you know country. we have a weird line. It's yeah. like a Western thing where we where there's we delineate between foods that we eat and right. foods that we you know not foods but pets that we like oh, well, treat you, like humans. You got to see what the Italians eat. Uh, the real so my grandmother used to eat something called caputzel. It's if you go to Arthur M, you'll see it still. You go to especially it's like the lamb's brains. So oh they, yeah yeah yeah. Half the head, you, you brine it, you boil, you throw spaghetti sauce on it. And then you eat the brain and you pick out the eye. Yeah. <laughs> Where can we find you? Twitter, C. Gasparino, Facebook, <laughs> Fox Business, The Post. Um, where else? I'll be at Sestina Restaurant tonight. <laughs> 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 All right, my friend. Well, it was ne- lovely to meet you. Thank you, you for too. writing this book. And I love I'll love your stuff. I'm glad I was love listening to Rogan stuff. that day when you said, Woman! Woman! You know what? I do. I've been, I've been getting back into comedy pretty aggressively. And pe- my fans will now come out and they'll yell women from the, so from the so good. It does, you see, if you said men, man, I'm a man, it doesn't have the same no. thing, right? Women! All right. I'll let you go. The check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie can now be found at Phetasy.com. It's been titled Another Round with Bridget Phetasy, and it's now in video. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)